The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. You guys heard about f- uh, Fazadienol? No. No. Should we? I don't know. It's a nasal spray that's supposed to ease social anxiety, like, immediately. You heard about this? This seems fake. I feel like this it, is a joke. It's, no, it's not. <laughs> a dad I just read it today. It's a, It activates receptors in the nose and affects the amygdala. About 40% of people with social anxiety di- disorder felt much less anxious after using it. And I'm thinking they should pipe it into medical schools. You guys really need... It, s- it couldn't hurt. ...some sort of anti-anxiety spray. Are we socially anxious or, just, or socially anxious or just anxious? Oh, okay. So that's a... <laughs> yeah. I think we're social and anxious. Like, we hang out together. We're just yeah, anxious there you together. Go. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So much of medical school is social. You know, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Coat Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast. It's the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SCP studio, a group of excellent public communicators, public messengers. Her clarity of thought and expression ensure that her audience is always open to her message. It's MD, PhD student, Maddie Walleen. Hi. She projects an authority and conviction through her vocal tone, body language, and content. It's MD, PhD student, Riley B. and Bush. Hi. And his visual aids enhance understanding when explaining complex or abstract concepts. It's M2 Jeff Goddard. Including jazz hands. (laughs) Yes, the ultimate visual aid. (laughs) But if you thought that was all the people with me today, that's where you're wrong. We're joined by Dr. Paul Offit, a renowned professor of pediatrics and director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as an interna- internationally recognized expert in virology and immunology, has contributed significantly to vaccine development. He's done extensive research in that area, as well as a ton of public education. He's been advisor to the FDA, the Autism Science Foundation, the Foundation for Vaccine Research. His most recent book is called Bad Advice or Why Celebrities, Politicians, and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information, a title I think we can get behind here on the Short Code Podcast. Welcome to the show. Dr. Offit. Thank you. My pleasure. Happy to be here. And and thank you, Jeff, for reaching out to Dr. Offit in the first place and setting this up. I know that you both share an interest in communicating medicine and science with a lay audience about medical topics. We're going to talk about politics today. If that's not your thing, I understand if you're not going to listen. But medicine is politics. Healthcare is politics. I would advise you to get used to it. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Offit, Paul, I honestly, this is really exciting for me. So I've read like all of your books. I, I told them secretly, I just want to be you when I grow up. So that was a bit of the impetus. For Bad us. idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to have this conversation with you because obviously it's no secret over the last several years, we've lost a lot of the public trust. And I think some of that is undeserved, some of that may be deserved, but it's been a hard battle and we need to be thinking seriously about how we're communicating with the public and having these conversations. And, you know, you, I mean, you've been doing this for decades and I would say rather effectively. So I wanted your voice and opinions on a couple of things today. Sure. So by decades, you meant I'm old. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Offit, I am new to your work through Jeff here introducing it, but a big fan and you've gained a new fan. So it's really awesome to have you here. And thanks to Jeff for like setting this up because I am also fangirling. I think what you do is really awesome. I've gotten on the soapbox a lot on this podcast, which is the way we communicate to both scientists and other people could be improved upon. And so especially coming from some MD, PhD students, that's a lot of what we do at this stage in our training. Or try to do. (laughs) Try to do, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll let you go first, Riley, if you have any questions that you wanted to talk about off the top of your head, not to put you on the spot. (laughs) I know. I feel suddenly very on the spot. You know, I think there were a few things that I have been really influential that you've said kind of in some of the, I guess, YouTube videos that I've watched of yours as far as some of the posts that you've been putting out about 
kind of vaccine misinformation and understanding what is really going on. And I think a lot of what you preach is kind of convincing the convincible. How have you come to that kind of point of which you are really trying to choose this specific subset of people? And how do you identify those people that are really going to be the best target to actually try to convince versus just kind of running your wheels and not getting anywhere? Yeah, I mean, because I've been, I guess, taking on the anti-vaccine sentiment as well as the anti-vaccine movement, meaning the professionals for about 20 years, I think I have a sense of who's out there. So because I, I talk to a lot of people, either at conferences or people that call me, and I think most people smell the smoke and they want to know whether there's any fire there. They want to trust their doctor. They want to trust the scientists, but they've just heard a lot and they're worried that it might be true. So that's what I would consider the convincible group. And I would say of the people who call me or I deal with the conferences, I'd say that's 85% of people. But then there's that solid 15% who just know more than I do. And they just know more than we do. They are there to tell me what they know to be true. And they're not convincible, but that's not who you're trying to convince. You're never going to convince them. So so I am largely heartened by, heartened by all this. I mean, I get certainly a lot of emails from people that say, thank you, this makes sense to me. I mean, whether it's, you know, the fear of aluminum or the fear of mercury in vaccines or whatever the issue is, some people just because they just want to know because it is a critical step to take a step away from your doctor. When you go into your doctor's office and you say, you know what, I don't want to get these vaccines. This is the same person you're going to when you're sick. I mean, you really want them to like you. And when you do that, when you say, I don't believe you, I don't trust you, I know more than you do, I know more than the medical profession does, that creates a very difficult interaction. Most people know that. So when parents say, look, I'm not getting this, you know already at some level that's an unconvincible person because that's a big step to take. You want your doctor to, to care about you and your child. One area that I've noticed over the years that scientists and physicians struggle with communicating to their patients and their and the general public is striking this balance between accessibility and accuracy. You know, so we've talked a few times on this show about that topic. And, you know, just for your background, I, we've talked about things like pro- proposing that all research articles include an explanation written for an eight-year-old audience. <laughs> but, or, or written by an eight-year-old, written, preferably. Written, yeah. written for, you know, like, basically, you know, a section of every paper should be, you know, it should be understandable by the lay public, at, or at least by science journalists. What's your philosophy on striking that balance when you try to communicate with the public? All right. So, so we, so when the CDC puts out its vaccine information sheets, that's written at roughly the fifth grade level. Yeah. When we try and put out our, so we have you know website as well as all these educational materials. We aim for roughly the eighth grade level, which is newspaper level. Yeah. Not scientific american level which is really like the 11th grade level so so we think we can hit sort of and we don't distinguish actually parents or patients and doctors we just think like roughly that's the same level the eighth grade level i don't know that probably doesn't sound right so like easy to digest by by everybody basically Right. But see, the thing that's impossible is so in 1995, for example, the the chickenpox vaccine came out and the uptake was really low initially in the first couple of years. And then it sort of it got better. But people would call me and they would say, you know, I've done my research and I've decided not to get the chickenpox vaccine. But what they mean by research is they mean they've looked on the Internet and found people's opinions about the chickenpox vaccine. I mean, if you really wanted to, and I was on the ACIP around that time, I came on in 19, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices to the CDC, I came on around 98. And if you really wanted to learn about the chickenpox vaccine, you should read the 300 articles that were published on the chickenpox vaccine, which would mean you would have to have an expertise in virology, immunology, epidemiology, statistics, etc. Few people have that. Few doctors have that, frankly. So, yeah, yeah. so, so who does have that? I mean, really, the people that have that are the people sitting around that table at the, the advisory committee for immunization practices or the FDA's vaccine advisory committee. Collectively, they've read those papers and they have a sense of all that because they, that's their experience and that's their expertise. But you're living in a time with sort of the kind of public library of science where everybody believes they also can learn all that. And I think people like RFK Jr., for example, take advantage of that. He'll always say, well, just read the science. Don't listen to me. Just read the science yourself. So so recently, I don't know if you are getting it. I don't think this is off topic, but he was in a sort of a fundraising event in New York City about a week ago where he talked to the group that was there about how 
uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was targeted to basically be more severe for Caucasians and Blacks and less severe for Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese. I don't know if you followed that story. I Did haven't heard that, that, but okay. It, it doesn't yeah, surprise yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So apparently this was an ethnically targeted virus, to which he referred to a paper, a scientific paper. Now, the the Democrats on that committee, this was all presented in front of, in addition to that fundraising event, This he presented this also to Jim Jordan's congressional subcommittee. But in any case, he, he so he referred to a paper. And the Democrats pretty much attacked him for this being a ludicrous statement, which it was, of course. But the, uh, there was one Republican who insisted on having that paper that he was referring to become part of the congressional record. Well, if you read that paper, it doesn't say that at all. I mean, it, first of all, this is not a lab leak. This was a animal to human spillover event that occurred in the Western section of the Hunan seafood market towards the end of 2019. The evidence is clear. And that's not what that paper said. It didn't say that at all. It was saying that there were, if you looked at sort of the two receptors on the surface of cells, the ACE2 receptor, as well as this, you know, the serine protease receptor, Temperance, that, that there are genetic polymorphisms, that those genetic polymorphisms differ among groups. But you were talking about the frequencies of one in 10,000 to one in 100,000. This is not anything you can say at the population level. This was only something that may be applicable to an individual, but not to the population level. And that's been true, right? I mean, who gets hospitalized and dies from this virus depends on your age, your comorbidities, whether you've been vaccinated, not whether or not you're an Ashkenazi Jew. So, so nonetheless, you know, because he counts on the fact that people don't read those papers, or even if they read those papers, aren't going to necessarily see those kind of flaws. So that's what you're up against. You're up against this notion that anybody can read a scientific paper and understand it when that's not true. On the other hand, you can't say that. You can never say, hey, trust us, we're experts. That's not exactly a message that flies here in the 21st century. So that's the problem. Yeah. And we should say that, you know, vaccine hesitancy, vaccine, anti-vaccine sentiment is not a new thing you know this has been around ever since the first vaccine i remember reading about what was the first smallpox you know people were saying very similar things about smallpox back in the day that they say now it's all the same stuff it's just i mean maybe now the internet is means that it's a lot easier for people to suggest i think it's just people. a lot easier to access m- misinformation right yeah I, I think the population that gives credence to those types of claims has waxed and waned over the years the size of that population right so maybe, yeah. i guess maybe my question would be i've had this conversation and it's ended up gotten a little bit of a heated debate but i fall squarely on the side of rfk jr is probably the most dangerous person that I could imagine running for president for the globe for just because of the hands that the United States has in global public health. And so that said, I mean, mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm naive here. I don't think that he would have had even as much attention as he has now in say 2016 or 2012. Something has changed over the last several years. I mean, obviously the pandemic, right? And it's not that he's gotten better at what he's doing. I think it seems like, you know, the anti-vax the movement, the people that do this professionally have more or less been doing the same shtick for a long period of time. So my question is, trying to have as much humility as possible, what what changed? What did we do to lose ground, lose this public trust in, in medicine and public health over the last several years that, that we can do to change? I guess so. what I'm looking for is ho- some hope that there are some <laughs> steps that we can take as a community to improve, right? So if there's something that we've missed, this, missed the mark on over the last several years, how can we gain that ground back? Well, I think conspiracy theories have moved into the mainstream. I, mm-hmm. I think that's become not this sort of fringe, outlying, crazy element. I think it's just very much part of who we are right now. I think this sort of anti-institutional backlash that you see now is that. I mean, you'll hear, you know, congressmen and senators say use the term deep state this notion that there's the forces out there that mean to do us harm so for example so so for example when andrew wakefield published his paper in 1998 claiming that the combination of measles mumps rubella and our vaccine caused autism which was really not a study at all it was just a case report of eight children who got the vaccine and then developed signs and symptoms of autism proving that the measles mumps rubella vaccine does not prevent autism it only prevents measles mumps and rubella infections but you know he that should have never been published but it was and so you know fair enough i mean you can argue that look From a parent's standpoint, my child was fine. They got a vaccine. Now they have signs and symptoms of autism because the vaccine is given at 12 months of age. When you start to see those signs, did this vaccine cause that? Uh, That's an answerable question. 
right? You're not answer, asking how many an angels can dance on the head of a pin here. This is an answerable question that can be answered in the scientific venue and has been. So there's been like 18 studies in seven countries on three continents, costing tens of millions of dollars, showing you're at no greater risk of getting autism if you've gotten that vaccine or if you hadn't. So there's one of two ways to interpret those 18 studies. One, the reason that those studies didn't find that autism was a consequence of our vaccine because it wasn't there to be found. Or two, there is a vast international conspiracy involving hundreds of researchers across the globe, all of whom are in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry that are designed to fool us because this vaccine does cause autism. And that is Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s assertion. He continues to say that MMR vaccine causes autism. And and it gains traction because there is fertile ground for that kind of conspiracy to take hold. And what we can do about that, can't imagine what we can do about that other than what we do, which is constantly try and put good information out there in a passionate, compassionate and understandable way and make it a human story, especially make it a human story that there are no risk free choices. And the choice not to get a vaccine is just a choice to take a different and more serious risk. And this is what that risk looks like, because I can tell you, I have never been more scared about the, uh, the power of the anti-vaccine movement than I am now. If you'd asked me at the beginning of this pandemic, what did I think would happen to the anti-vaccine movement in a COVID pandemic? I thought it would be crushed. Here you had in 2020, a virus that came into this country who could kill people, was killing hundreds of thousands of people, as many as sometimes 3,000 a day. We had nothing. We had not monoclonal antibodies. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't have antivirals until the end of the year. And then you had a vaccine which was remarkably safe, remarkably effective in December. And we started vaccinating people, right? A thousand, a million a day, two million a day, three million a day. But by April, May, we hit a wall. We couldn't get past that roughly 70 percent. There was 30 percent of people in this country that simply were not going to get vaccinated because they didn't trust it. Here you, and you, it, it, Historically, for me, the anti-vaccine movement has been, look, why should I get a polio vaccine? And polio doesn't happen. I, why should I get a diphtheria vaccine? Diphtheria doesn't happen. Or, hey, I had chicken pox. I'm fine. So the, the diseases either were gone or were trivial. But that's not, first of all, that's not, neither of those things is true. Those vaccines, those diseases aren't gone. And these yeah. Diseases aren't true. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but here was a virus where people were dying right in front of them. I mean, nobody had some knew some everybody knew someone who was felled by this virus or hospitalized with this virus. Still, they were able to exist on this high level of denialism. And I think we leaned into a libertarian left hook. I, you know, we have now, you know, hundreds of lawsuits directed against mandating masks, mandating vaccines. And I think that they've become even more powerful. And what I worry about most is measles. I mean, in, in 2019, we had about 1,200 cases of measles. Since then, it's just been a couple dozen cases every year. But, but this is the virus to worry about, because when immunization rates fray, this is the most contagious of the vaccine preventable disease, and this virus is going to come back. I really think it's going to come back. Look at what happened in Samoa, where they dropped immunization rates from 70% to 30%, and 83 babies die from measles. And uh, measles kills you. You know, the death rate's about one in a thousand and get to a few thousand cases and we'll see, start, start to see children die of measles again, die of a vaccine preventable disease. That's what's going to happen because it's always the children who suffer, right? It's always the most vulnerable among us who suffer. Short Coats, we love to hear from you, no matter what it's about. So call us at 347-SHORT-CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. Interesting that you use the word story in there. I sometimes see a, a gap where scientists and doctors are talking about these very important issues in scientific terms, or even when they're trying to communicate with lay people, you know, using less scientific terms. But one of the things I don't see a lot is stories. And I think people are sort of hardwired to understand stories in a way that they're not hardwired to understand the nuance of you know p values, p -values data, and data and, I think and that's... exceptions and all this kind of stuff and i'm wondering if that's a way if stories are an underutilized aspect of communicating these about these issues so, so i guess my question my concern is i wasn't necessarily very active personally but i was trying to passively observe a lot of the communication going on during COVID. I, so i was working in the hospital and uh, certainly, you know, I saw patients who, whose relative was literally dying or had just passed away, and they're still denying the, the severity of the disease or even the existence of the disease right in front of us. And that's kind of odd, you know, but 
I did see, at least in the public sphere, and this is maybe something that I've it has changed because we have things like Twitter or whatever we're calling it now, or you know the, these other public forum <laughs> spaces where the break room is all of a sudden in the public sphere, where we would have you know people on the one side saying the most ridiculous things like COVID doesn't exist, or simultaneously it doesn't exist, but also it was invented by the Chinese government, and also hospitals have this conspiracy to, to make up numbers and all this stuff on that side, but then on on the other side, you know healthcare workers making up very that seeming seemingly very untrustworthy stories to push this the idea that this is something that we should take serious and they would tell these stories that you would see just copy paste it and it's the same story but i don't know i lost a lot of confidence in my fellow healthcare workers because of the absolutism and the over emotionalization of the virus as well oh uh, yeah i see what you're saying yeah, yeah there's i do yeah i do also think that one of the mistakes that we made was trying to sound certain about things that we weren't certain about. Yeah, I mean, so so it just for context, I mean, Dr. Offit, one of the reasons that I've been such a huge fan of yours throughout the pandemic was, for example, with the vaccine, it, very early on, you were like, well, we're kind of holding our breath because we don't know if this is going to be good. And then you were able to, you know, comfortably look at the data. Of course, you're an expert, so you, then you can make a lot more sense of the data than somebody like, you know, me who hasn't had that training and say, okay, you know what? I, I changed my mind. I do have a lot more confidence in this now. This is actually quite miraculous that this is, been able to help so many people that that level of confidence and communicating with people but willing to concede that there are things that we don't know i just i'm sad that i don't see that enough i feel like i see a lot of absolutism on both sides and i think well, that's you, you know when you're a politician or, a, or maybe a cdc director or whatever position you have i imagine that you feel as though you need to present the answer and this probably happens just with regular doctoring too you know like you feel like you have to present the reason, the answer, the solution, even if you might not have one. Yeah. Well, I'd expand it too, because you look at Twitter, TikTok, whatever, whoever, wherever people are getting their information on social media now, what gets views is not nuanced, lengthy discussion of what is going on, but it is clickbait and it is kind of sensationalized stories that are going to get the views. I even notice myself if I watch a video and it's 15 seconds in and I'm like, well, on to the next one because my focus is waning. So I guess, Dr. Offit, from your perspective, you've put information out in a lot of different mediums now. So I've seen YouTube videos of yours, blog posts of yours, tweets of yours. How do you feel that the different forms of media stack up against each other in regards to actually convincing people? And like, what do you think is really the best form of communication? And what is an area that scientists need to grow in to better their communication? Yeah, see, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that question because you note here, I'm older. So, so <laughs> it's all news to me. I mean, thank goodness for my wife and my daughter, who's who uh, sort, of, sort of drove me to, you know, having a sub stack and then having tweets and, you know, having a Facebook page and all that. So that so it's clear, it is clear to me, though, that, that in my day, I mean, you know, the television was the most influential or newspapers were the most influential. Yeah. That's not true anymore. It's social media. I mean, and, and so you, so it's enormously noisy. And how do you get above the noise? Or I, we have a subset called Beyond the Noise. I mean, how do you do that? And it, it's just really hard. And I think it gets to the point that was made earlier that you have to be able to tell a very compelling, compassionate story. But I would say one thing, Jeff, because you brought it up. I completely agree with you that the absolutism worked against us. I, you can see where it comes from. I mean, you're having, you know, thousands of people dying every day and you want them to use this product. And so so you tend to be absolute about it. You don't want to show any evidence that you're wavering, because if, if it looks like you're wavering, then people won't get that product. And, uh, you know, and I've seen the pushback on that with when the bivalent vaccine was presented to our committee. I mean, I, the, I'm the, on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee back in June of 2022. It didn't look very good. I mean, the data in terms of whether that bivalent vaccine, remember, this was the data we were presented was with BA1, which was the original Omicron strain, and then compared with the Wuhan vaccine. Those data were pretty unconvincing. Plus, by the time we sat down, BA1 was gone. So, OK, well, let's use BA4, BA5, right, because that's what was current then. So we had no human data. We had no human data on BA4, BA5. We said, okay, well, BA1 maybe is analogous to this, although even those data weren't very convincing. And so the government bought 171 million doses and recommended it strongly without any human data. When the human data finally came around, you know, from David Ho's lab at Columbia or Dan Brooks' lab at Harvard, 
you didn't get any better of a neutralizing antibody response to BA4, BA5. And by the time the vaccine was finally available, BA4 was gone and BA5 was sort of being overtaken by other Omicron subvariants. And so I was on TV, you know, with because I was on TV a fair amount, you know, on CNN or less commonly on MSNBC. And so you're asked to sort of, you know, you're asked to be honest. I mean, I just, I felt the compelling need to be honest. And I, I, you know, I remember it was Pamela Brown on CNN who showed a clip of Ashish Jha saying, this is a much better vaccine than what we had. This is much better than the original strain, the ancestral strain. You need to get it because it's better. So then she turns to me after showing this clip and she says, well, was he wrong? Well, the answer to that question is yes, he was wrong. But, you know, you can't say that exactly. So what you say is, There was just two papers in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed this was no better than what we had. It boosters boost. This will boost. And but realize it's no better than what we had. So I just contradicted somebody who was the coronavirus task coordinator, Ashish Jha, at the this, the at the White House. And he wasn't happy about that. And others weren't happy about that because you have to have this unified front. Because when you show that you're in any sense questioning it, that it looks bad, but it's the only way science works. I mm. mean, there, that's the only cauldron in which science works is you're constantly questioning, right? I mean, that's your scientific training is that to get the best data, you constantly constantly question the quality and validity and robustness and internal consistency of data. That's how it works. I mean, I'm also not paid by the White House, so it makes it much easier for me to say it. Nor am I paid by the FDA, right? We're an advisory committee. So so that's what you know. The other one other point I want to make, though, is that our training as scientists is the opposite of the training for being a science communicator. I mean, to be a good scientist, you never go beyond the data in front of you. Never. That's the worst mistake you could make. You feel you have to reduce uncertainty by having caveat after caveat after caveat. That does not work well on television or the radio. I mean, you have to, you can't really say MMR vaccine doesn't cause autism. You can only say that with all the studies that have been done, it's extremely unlikely. You can't prove never. You can't reject the null hypothesis. And you always know that in the back of your head. You know you can't say that, but you say it anyway, because it's true. (laughs) MMR doesn't cause autism. It's just that the study, I mean, these aren't mathematical theorems you don't have proofs doesn't yeah. work that way i'm really glad you brought that up because i think we've talked about that a lot on this podcast which is the convoluted nature of biostatistics and how to really understand it and how nuanced Riley, i want to point out that the last time you yes <laughs> you talked about biostatistics we got hate mail somehow <laughs> yes which so i we, don't understand we got some hate comments when i tried to under to explain the nuance of biostatistics and even as a fifth year student at this point that even my own self gets confused about what statistical methods are being used when they're being used and how that creates uncertainty in whatever you have quote unquote discovered in your body of research. And so I'm glad that you brought that up, which is I find myself always wanting in the best, I guess, example of science to inject that uncertainty into communication I have with just loved ones, nobody that is really outside my scope. So I'd love if you talked a little bit about kind of the best practices for talking about some of that uncertainty, even if you have some examples, because it would be great to understand in terms of like the COVID vaccines, or I know you just gave one example, but further examples of how to best elaborate on that small amount of uncertainty that we have in science in a way that is compelling for people that are not going to understand P values and T tests. I feel like this is the big question. Yes. Right. I think, remember, you're talking to people who aren't going to understand that this sort of the essence of it, which is, you know, how one comes to a formulate a hypothesis, establish burdens of proof, subject those burdens of proof to statistical analysis. That's not the group you're talking to. And I, I think you're trying to simplify it in the way that's the most compelling. I guess I'll give you the most recent example, at least to me, what is today's August 9th. So the CDC last year recommended the COVID vaccine for everyone over six months of age. We're the only country that did that. The other countries did what I think made the most sense, which is target the groups who are most likely to be hospitalized and die, because the goal of this vaccine is to prevent 
serious illness. It's not to prevent all illness because this virus is going to circulate for the rest of your life and it's going to cause mild disease in people who've been highly vaccinated or previously infected or both. And that's just what this virus is going to do. There's It's a short incubation period, mucosal infection. This is not a long incubation period disease. You're never going to eliminate it. It's not like smallpox or measles or polio, which are longer incubation period diseases, and you can come close to eliminating at least the disease component. So, so I'm, I listen to, by the way, to answer your question, what is do I think has the most power in terms of social media? I think it's podcasts. I mean, if you look at somebody like Lex Fridman has RFK Jr. on his podcast, has 3 million people listen to that podcast. Joe Rogan has 11 million people listening to a podcast episode. He also had RFK Jr. on. I mean, RFK Jr., I mean... We got to get I, RFK Jr. on this <laughs> We got to do so many other things that I'm not. <laughs> I was going to say, Dave, we only have so many episodes in a year. Oh, I'm gosh, sorry, I continue. I, I apologize. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I mean, he has his Children's Health Defense has $15 million at last year in funding. I mean, he is I, he is also of counsel to the law firm of Morgan & Morgan, which is a big class action. So what do they pay him to do? They pay him to stir up fear of the environment, fear of all these toxic chemicals that are causing gender dysphoria or whatever he's he's claiming. And so they have the money, they have the political power, they have the influence, they have the media savvy. They're very good at what they do. And, you know, you and I do the best we can and try and get it out there. And I, you know, I have this podcast I do with Vincent Racaniello, who also does, you know, This Week in Virology. And, uh, you know, and you'll get 20,000 views. So some of the ones I got 300,000 views. So I was really happy about that. But for the most part, you know, it's hard to win. But it, it, but you're right. It's hard to it's hard to reduce complexity into something simple and bite-sized and easy, especially on television, less so in a print media where you have a longer format. To, to, you can explain things. But I think the most important thing is you have to be compelling about what's at stake, I mean, it's very hard for me to go into Children's Hospital Philadelphia. I'm on service again next week. And I will no doubt see children who come into that hospital who are unvaccinated, whose parents are unvaccinated, whose siblings are unvaccinated, who will come into the hospital and perhaps go to the intensive care unit. I mean, you're starting to see somewhat of an upsurge now in hospitalizations with this EG1, sorry, EG5 variant. And it's really hard. And in some ways, you're right. You don't want to over-dramatize it. You know, you don't want it to sort of be too heavy-handed. But at some level... That does work, I'd like to say. The, I remember with varicella vaccine, those first couple of years in 95, 96, 97, when the uptake was really small or low, Merck did a campaign, I can't believe I lost a child to varicella. And it was in all the medical journals. They really put it out there. And they showed a lot of pictures of hemorrhagic varicella, which is grotesque, and talked about childhood deaths. Because there'd be 75 to 100 childhood deaths a year. And they were criticized for that as being too heavy-handed. But the rates of immunization went up much more dramatically. So it's a fine balance. And I don't know how best to strike it, but you do, you fear does sadly sell. Yeah, I guess so. I get the need for a sense of loyalty, right? For example, Anthony Fauci has done so much for public health over his long career. He's made some mistakes over that career. If he hadn't, he wouldn't be human, right? So, but we feel a sense as a healthcare community who is trying to save lives to defend each other, even when we do make mistakes. And I think that, I don't know, that... (sighs) I don't know if RFK would be so successful in, say, Germany or Sweden or countries that have more trust in their public health system. But I also don't know how to improve the trust in our public health system, except for trying to be somewhat humble. But also, like you said, like, you know, he can make a claim that it takes me, you know, I don't know, 20 years of science education to have gotten to a point where I can really explain what's going on here. And I can't teach you organic chemistry in order to have this conversation you know so it's hard and i don't know what to do about it but i obviously not give up but i'd like to get our country to a place where we have enough trust in our public health that somebody like him can be you know properly shunned to the outskirts of society a little bit more instead of you know getting funding to run for president yeah i think actually tony just called me the other day about the one of the the sort of vincent rack and yellow things i did having to do with rfk jr and the Samoa outbreak and what is the definition of free speech i mean you know is a disinformation campaign just fall into the category of free speech because he's getting hammered now for you know being brought up in front of all these committees to try and defend the fact that he's he was supposed he was trying to mute you know people like rfk jr it's just it's a mess no one who has commented on this virus or this disease has been has not said something that was dead wrong yeah but so that's the issue right so so if you ask people 
Do you think that 100 years from now, we're going to know more about science and medicine than we know? And now I think everybody says yes, right? But when it comes to this virus and this pandemic, people want us to know everything that you need to know right now. And so you want to have this sense of, you know, of, of, of knowledge, you know, this sense of confidence. But the point that you made, and I think the most important word that you used, Jeff, was humility, because that's right, because nature is a cruel taskmaster. You learn as you go, and often you learn the hard way with human price. I mean, no one anticipated myocarditis as a consequence of this vaccine. Nobody anticipated blood clots, including fatal brain blood clots with the J&J vaccine, which is now why it's essentially off the market in the United States. No one anticipated that. But early on, I remember the, the companies, both the CEOs of Pfizer and Moderna, very early on when they were in phase one trials, were talking about how the, at this point they vaccinated maybe 25 people, you know, or less than 100 people. And they were saying, we can make 10 million doses. We can make 100 million doses. And and I remember I was on CNN and I used your word, Jeff. I said, how about a little humility here? We're in phase one. I mean, there's a lot to learn here and those lessons are going to be hard earned. But we're always wrong. I mean, I've been wrong. Everybody who's commented on this has been wrong yeah. at some point. And I think now with the, it just is upsetting to me that we're sort of likening this virus to influenza. This is not influenza virus. It, when, when Every year in March of the year, the, we, the FDA vaccine advisory committee picks flu, picks flu strains, right? We base it on strains that are circulating in winters that precede ours, like Australia or South America. And we're usually right, but not always. So we've been wrong three times in the last 20 years. Wrong, dead wrong, wrong on the H3N2 strain that came into the country. And the protective efficacy was approach zero in some groups. I mean, it was it's a strain-specific phenomenon. That's not this virus. I mean, this if you look at Wuhan 1, or you look at the current strain like EG5 or the XBB15, the T-cell epitopes have remained pretty much conserved across those strains. And because T-cells are critical for protection against serious disease, especially cytotoxic T-cells, as has been shown in a series of papers recently, we're still good. You're still protected against serious disease, even if so. So the, picking a strain like you know the XBB15 or last year a BA4 or BA5 doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's about five members of the FDA vaccine advisory committee that continue to say that every time we meet. But it's what they want to do. And so what do you do? You want to. This is what you said. You want to be loyal. You want to pre present a united front. And it, but it, the minute you question what we're doing, it looks like we don't know what we're doing. So how do you do that? How do you handle? that. My attitude on this is tell the truth and tell people how this is always a process of learning in, in, as you go. And But you have to be open-minded to it. This is the beauty of science, right, is that it's enormously self-correcting. I mean, we're willing to take textbooks and throw them over our shoulder without a backward glance as we learn. I mean, when I was a pediatric resident at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh in the late 70s, we learned from our senior pediatricians that when a baby feeds, you should lay them on their stomach so they don't regurgitate you know, the fluid into their windpipe and lungs. Bad idea. I mean, we since learned, and then by the 90s, that increased your risk of sudden death syndrome. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics launched their back to sleep program. And the instance of meaning lay on your back after you get your after you eat or sleep when you sleep. And so the instance of sudden infant death syndrome dramatically declined. That doesn't mean that the people who taught me when I was a resident we're just ignorant. It just means we didn't know. Well, I guess technically that is what it is. That is ignorance. Yeah. But yeah. They weren't <laughs> jerks. We don't mean it as a pejorative. <laughs> we just, yeah. That's just where we were. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess, so I know that not everything can be, you know, not everything that you do on the individual level is the same as what we do on the population level. But one thing I think could Maybe. I don't know. I'll get your thoughts on it. If I'm working with the patient, I want to be able to communicate a certain level of uncertainty about the disease process. Like th this is how we expect that this disease is going to progress based on what we know, but we're going to continue to track it because that may not be the case, you know, and then we're going to do the best that we can. But I, I don't know, having that humility, but like asserting the confidence in what we do know and then having the humility to that there are things that we may not know, but we are going to learn together and we're going to stay with it together and we're going to get there. I feel like would mean a lot more for me as a patient. And it's certainly the few interactions that I've had as a clinician, that's built enough camaraderie that we can trust one another to move forward, even if there's some things that we're wrong about, right? Well, I think you want a doctor to to be, to have humility. I think you want a doctor to, to say, you know, we're maybe not, you know, we're going to make a whole bunch, whole mess of mistakes and screw this up and, you know, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. But to say that, you know, I'm here with you, I'm here to monitor this situation and to, and, and, you know, put your faith in me because 
we're going to we're working towards the same thing. Yeah. And I understand that politicians have this. I'm going to I don't want to be mean, but a bit of a savior complex. Right. They want to be the ones that come in with the right answer. And this is what we're going to do. But I feel like we at a. I don't even know that it's necessary for politicians to have the right answer these days. I feel like... And the, just any answer. Just, just an any an, answer. No, any extreme answer. No, an, an answer that makes people go, oh, yeah. Arr, like A rally and cry. Yeah, mm-hmm. like just any old... Furthers group think anything. Yeah, it's to like know. bring groups together. Yeah. Like, Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Thank you. I was just thinking that when we talk about politics and when you were talking, Dr. Offit, about measles coming back and children dying, like there's an emotional response to that. And it's hard sometimes not to get like angry and to have those emotions and so my question is how do you kind of maintain like your empathy when you're dealing with people who are not you know professionals of the anti-vax movement but who are suffering kind of from that no and that's the right distinction those two groups i think that i think it's perfectly reasonable to be scared of vaccines i mean for the most part you're asking children to get vaccines to prevent 14 different diseases as children as young children another three when you get older and so that can mean as many as 26 inoculations in the first few years of life it can mean as many as five shots at one time to prevent diseases most people don't see using biological fluids most people don't understand i think it's perfectly reasonable to be skeptical about vaccines so i'm completely empathetic to that i am but I am completely non-empathetic to the professionals. I mean, the RFK Jr. who made $500,000 last year from his children's health defense, or Lynn Redwood, or who's paid to do it, or Mary Holland, who's paid to do it, or Bell, Del Bigtree, who's head of the Informed, Informed, should be in quotes, Informed Consent Action Network. You know, these people are, this, they're doing it for a living. They're paid to do it. And I just, I have no sympathy for them. Quite the opposite. I have an enormous amount of hatred for them because (laughs) they are putting children in harm's way and and they're perfectly fine with them. They are. I just can't take it. I just it just constantly I am fueled by anger (laughs) is what and when they send me hate mail and stuff, and I actually got an email from like I think a staffer from RFK Jr. was sort of at RFK Jr., but I'm always happy when I'm getting on their nerves. Because you know you're doing the right, you're doing the right thing. Something that's really stuck out to me, not on the professional side, but on just the general fear of vaccines, and I think this was something that you had said in one of the things that I was kind of binging in preparation for this interview. But you would mentioned that it is scarier to put a child in harm's way with a vaccine by doing something than it is to do nothing and just let it be. Like there is a greater fear that you will actively do something as opposed to just not doing anything and then, oops, something happens. I don't, what would you say to individuals to kind of get them to understand that? Because it's a very human response, which is like, oh, I don't want to actually do the thing, but if it just happened to me, then... That's just nature working its way. Sins of commission versus sins of omission. Yeah, thank you. That is a much shorter way to say it. And I liked that, but I couldn't catch it earlier. (laughs) (laughs) Right. It's just an emotional thing. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Rota Shield vaccine, which came onto this market in the United States in 1998, it was on the market for 10 months till it was taken off because it was caused of intussusception, right? Intestinal blockage, which can be a serious and occasionally fatal illness. If you looked at the incidents, and I was on the advisory committee for immunization practice at the time, and so when it became clear what the attributable risk was of that problem, it was clear at the same time that you were still five to ten times more likely to die of rotavirus, which kills maybe 60 people in this country every year, babies, and causes about 75,000 hospitalizations a year, you can, that, that even in this country, you were five to ten times more likely to die. So I presented that to the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, trying to make a plea not to take it off the market. It didn't matter. The company took it off the market anyway, independent of what we were going to do. So that was the way it worked. And to take it a step further, so now you have this virus, which kills 500,000 people a year in the world, one of the biggest killer of babies in the world, kills as many as 2,000 babies a day, primarily in developing world countries, Asia, Africa, South America. So then four months later, I go to the World Health Organization, right, where Wyeth was good. Wyeth was the manufacturer 
manufacturer of that vaccine, Rota Shield. I'm the, the uh, fortunate enough to be part of a team at CHOP that de- Children's Hospital Philadelphia developed the, the next rotavirus vaccine, which was Rota Tech. But it was seven years later that next vaccine came on the market. So you go to now the World Health Organization in Geneva and making the same case. You're, now, now here, the risk-benefit ratio is very different because now you have 2,000 children dying a day in the developing world, right? <laughs> so we made that case and Wyeth was great. They said, look, we'll give you the vaccine. We won't try and protect it with a patent. We'll give you the cells in which we grow it. We'll show you how to make this vaccine. We're giving it to you, right? Because here's a life-saving technology that was about to sit on the shelf. And country after country stood up and said, it's not safe for America's children. It's not safe for our children. <laughs> but again, it's they're willing to let, you know, 2,000 children die a day to avoid the risk of about one in 30,000 that would develop in a susception. People, so, people are really bad at evaluating risk, especially when it comes to their loved ones. I think that's the message yeah. there. I, you know, like, and, and I understand that, you know, it, 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 when you're talking about your child, right? It seems incredibly risky to do this, to, you know, to allow a doctor to give you an, an, an uh, vaccination because, because, because the cost, the the, right. Yeah. Well, and the potential, you know, if there is a vaccine injury, right. And vaccine injuries exist. If there is a vaccine inju- injury, the cost is so high to you as a parent, as a, you know, as a family, as a, you know, for the kid, like, and you but have to again, live with the fact that you're the one that caused it, right, right? Right. as opposed I, to if he does happen to get measles and it, it gives a severe reaction and the child dies, that was somebody else's fault. That was right. just nature happening, right? And that's, I don't know, I guess well, I'm analytical to a fault, but I do get it. Like, this is the reason why we have the trolley problem, for example, right? When we talk about, well, is it worse if I push the guy, you know, versus if I'm just pulling a switch, right? We are aware of the fact that we have a hard time doing the thing that might cause harm as opposed to just letting the harm happen but yeah having that conversation and helping people de-emotionalize it and being able to say like the results the end results this is just the safer option yeah but what's Um, hard is it is an inherently emotional thing to do i mean i personally do not have children but i can imagine like the emotion that i feel for the future children that i will have is a lot even as a person who doesn't have them i think medical you almost had a meltdown when you got a puppy so yeah that's true you're you're gonna for the previous listeners they they really know (laughs) my puppy is my child regardless though but medical decisions come with some level of emotion and scientists and doctors we do a lot of work to find that balance of emotion within our work i know like when experiments fail i'm sad but i get over it the next day and i realize that i can do it again and as a doctor i think it's really hard when you have to tell someone some really terrible information but you have to do it in a way that has just the right amount of emotion but not too much and that you are now crying but you have to tell them in a way that is strong yet still filled with emotion and i wonder if the way that we communicate science is lacking in that balance of emotion that balance of story kind of as we've talked about it do we think that we need more emotion and raw feeling in the way that we communicate it to people which is like i'm a parent and i'm scared too But here's why I'm making these decisions. I've seen people do this on social media platforms and it's been really powerful. And a lot of people have commented and they're like, you know what? I'm a parent too. And I also felt this way. And I also made the decision to vaccinate. So where does emotion fall into all of this? Because although it should be without emotion, I think there's a necessary amount that is there. You you know, my wife's in private practice pediatrics. So what she would do is and it's sort of in the suburban Philadelphia area. So, you know, she's seeing sort of a, generally an upper middle class group. So so what she used to do when people would come in and say, look, I don't want to get the vaccine, she would go, give me three times to convince you. And, you know, she would try and try. And she maybe had a 25% success rate. And then she said, forget it. I'm not going to see people who are doing this. So she said she would say this, let me love your child. Don't put me in a position where you're asking me to send this child out of this office unvaccinated when I know that pneumococcus is still out there and can cause, you know, sepsis and meningitis and uh, and pneumonia or, you know, varicella is still out there, which can cause, you know, you know, invasive skin infections and necrotizing fasciitis, etc. Don't put me in that position. I can't do it. 
And so if you're going to do that, if you're going to put me in that position, I can't see your child. And with that, her success rate rose dramatically. So she was going to lay it on that. And it's hard to confront patients. We're not comfortable with that. And so you have to, but ultimately you're the child's advocate. You're the child's advocate and the parent is the one who's standing between you and advocating for that child. So that's the person you have to convince. So she laid it on the line emotionally and was much more successful. She actually started to give talks about it her success that's that's, that's really actually yeah it's really powerful it's kind of flips the script of what we're taught to do that where we're supposed to be somewhat aloof removed yeah reserved yeah. in our emotions instead deciding to be vulnerable with the patient and saying look th- this hurts me to not take care of your child well i can't not do the thing that i've spent my entire life trying to do that's i don't know i got chills so yeah thank I you for also, sharing that i agree because i think you hear people that are not are choosing to not vaccinate their children they go oh well my doctor is not going to see them anymore like the medical professionals are forgetting about us like they don't care about us it's like you no, damn if you that's do or damn the if you opposite don't. and what that anecdote about your wife shows is like no no we care so much that it viscerally is painful for us to try to help you when i can't and yeah. i think that is what is so powerful about injecting that emotion in there is you start hopefully People hear that and they think, wow, they really do care yeah. about me. Because, I mean, we do. At least most doctors and doctors in training really care. We're just trying to find that balance of showing you how much we care. And to social media's credit, I think some of the platforms like TikTok and YouTube, like where you can post something a little bit more long form, there are some really good health educators on those apps who do use emotion and tell stories to kind of get their points across. Jen Hamilton's a good example. She's a labor and delivery nurse. And you do, like, you can see how much she cares. And that is really powerful, as we mentioned. I think emotion is a really powerful tool. This isn't the first time that I've thought this on this podcast, but I guess my hesitancy to use these stories is because I've seen people like RFK Jr., you know, give again an anecdotal evidence to something and then you know go off the deep end and so i know that those stories connect with people and then i can back it up with data yeah but my brain says don't be like them well i want to suggest that the balance that you can strike is using the story to give context to what you're about to say not necessarily to say that this story proves my point right yeah and this is what good you know really good journalists do you know you start off with a story that says you know, these are the stakes. Now let me tell you what's behind those stakes. Yeah. And that seems like a kind of a helpful idea. I don't know. Yeah. And the thing is, like, as much as I have this hesitancy f- for silly reasons, like, I know what draws me in. So, you know, Dr. Offit, like, reading your books, like, it's the narrative that drives me into it. And then the data keeps me there. Mm-hmm. And I know that. I know what pulls me in. It's, you know, talking about Jonas Salk's story as much as it is about the data behind the success. And I guess I just need to get better at embracing that part of the human narrative that we like stories. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're here. They're compelled by a story. When you write a book, you want people to turn the page. What drives them is to turn the page. Yeah. And I do tell people that a lot of the time, because I, I like fiction a lot and I like to you know write fictions because it can convey some of the more important truths of humanity, the deep stuff. Right. And I often tell people that like more than anything else, we're a storytelling species. Like that's the one thing that makes humanity humanity is that we tell stories and I'm still sitting over here thinking, but look at this graph. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. I spent a lot of time as I'm writing scientific papers thinking, what is the story right. that I'm telling? Yeah. So yeah. I think that as science communication, like in the literal sense, not just to the public, like literally writing scientific papers, I think it's evolving and I think it's getting better at weaving stories so that it is a really compelling argument. I mean, yeah. more than off, more often than not now, I'm going to talks and like, you know, 25% of it is background, which is arguably the most important part. Why do I care about what you're talking about? Yeah. And I think that we're getting there as scientists. And I think that the science communicators to the public are really kind of pulling us up and really challenging us. I'm speaking for all of scientists, I guess, but <laughs> challenging all of scientists to like get better at this. Yeah. And I think I can feel that. I've really enjoyed this. I want to thank you, Dr. Offit, for taking the time to talk with us today. It really has been wonderful. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Where should we direct people? 
right. See, they always ask that question. I never have the answer. I, I think so. I have a Here's website. a little secret nobody ever does. Okay. <laughs> like, I think it's like paul offit.com or something like that. Google. <laughs> and it has a lot of those sort of books that I've written are all sort of on there. But we'll put a link. I'll put a link great. to your website. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> you shouldn't have trouble finding it. The, I do have a book coming out in February called Tell Me When It's Over, just of sort of my experience over the last few years with this pandemic, especially from because I was on the NIH active committee by, with Fran Collins, Francis Collins trying to design these trials and then on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. So it's been a kind of had a upfront look at the way this all played out. And so oh, that, I'm looking forward to that. That's yeah, definitely. Cool. And Jeff, thank you for helping to bring Dr. Offit here today. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was an honor. Yeah. And what, Maddie, Riley, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Dave. And what kind of communicator would I be if I didn't thank you, Shortcoats, for making us part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow us wherever fine podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. We're in all the places. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look. Life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need and so i'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use but the bottom line is that for what it's worth i see you i know you're out there i wish i could do more maybe i can in ways that i don't understand yet or know about but i see you and i'm glad you're here and other people are too The Short Code Podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, 